back in our Father's Word, book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to pick it up there in a moment. Paul is coming down on the Galatians pretty good. He said, you, he, he established the church there, and they went for it big time. They loved him, and they loved the gospel. And then they had some super preachers that later came in, and they were legalists trying to turn them back to the old ceremonies and the old way and some of the old blood rituals, such as circumcision. And, and Paul said, have, have I wasted my time on you all? That, that I've taught you the truth, the gospel, and now you turn back to the old way, which is unnecessary. You're beginning to worship days and months instead of Christ by your holidays and holy days. When we have Christ every day, and that's what's important. Christ became our high Sabbath. Um, Hebrews chapter 4 makes it very clear. But most of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover. That's the highest Passover that a holiday, Sabbath, that a Christian can have. And you need to pay attention to what Father taught. And, and Paul's a little bit upset about it, that they would revert back and listen to a bunch of knuckleheads instead of sticking with God's Word. So let's pick it up, if we may, as he continues that line of thought. Uh, chapter 4, verse 13, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, uh, You know how through, though, through infirmity, that's the weakness of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Paul, Paul was, he, he was weak in this sense that he, he had trouble seeing. He, Father left that thorn in his flesh after he was taken to that third heaven age uh, as a reminder. And he said, even though I had that weakness, you still listen to me. Verse 14, and my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despise not, nor rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Even as I taught Christ Jesus, you receive me. You receive me as that spreader of the gospel, a man of God. 15. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record. Now, I'm going to call it to your attention that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. You would, because of the weakness of my eyes, you, if you could have, when I first brought you that message, you would have taken, plucked out your own eyes and gave them to me. Well, that wasn't possible, but, uh, but he's saying how much they loved him, and then they would revert back. He said, have I wasted my time on you all. Verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Are you going to, you're going to follow the rule of God and the word of God? Or are you going to follow traditions of men? And, and because I do bring you the word of God, do I become your enemy because you've listened to a bunch of fruitcakes? I'm not calling names. That's what they are if they don't teach God's word and it misleads people. Verse 17. They zealously afflict you, but not well. Or oh, they are balls of the fire, the way they bring forth their message. Yea, they would exclude you <clears throat> from the gospel, that is, that you might affect, uh, afflict them. That is to say, um, they will drop off the gospel and teach you their uh, zealous uh, falseness. But when you follow them, you leave off the gospel. You know, that's, that's a bad trip, my friends. And you know, there, you must always remember this. There's nothing new under the sun. When somebody tries to bring you along some new religion they dreamed up and you cannot back it up in God's word, you better be real careful because there is nothing, as Ecclesiastes chapter 1 declares, nothing new under the sun. And in Mark 13, Christ would teach you, I have foretold you all things. The question is, have you read them? That's the point. Verse 18. But it is good to be uh, zealously afflict, afflicted, affected, that is to say, always in a good thing, the gospel. 
and not only when I am present with you, but uh, it, it, even by this letter, I hope it works to that extent. So when I'm with you, I don't have to be so hard. Verse 19, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I, I, I feel like your, your um, spiritual father and that I birthed you, meaning I brought you the message in the beginning, and, and you accepted it. It affected your lives in such a way that it brought you up. It edified you. It put you in walk with God himself, whereby you had the blessings of God. Verse 20, I desire to be present with you now. Wish I could be. And to char change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. I, I wish I could come there and I wish I could be softer in voice in appreciation to you. I've, I've got a little bit of doubt here in as much as I know what you're doing. Listening to uh, legalism and turning back to the old way, you know, again, I'm going to emphasize circumcision was one of the main things. That's bloodletting. And anytime you claim bloodletting is religious, Christ shed his blood on the cross, you are flirting with bad trouble because that's almost sacrilegious because Christ shed blood for one in all times and circumcision now is both for male and female and it is of the heart to know and to love him for what he, had, what he has done for us, what he has made possible for us through repentance, the forgiveness of all sin. So this is why he's a little upset at them. You know, that... Um, that you would make a mockery of the crucifixion. 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Have you read it? Have you, you that want to be under it, have you ever really studied it? Do you know the difference between laws, statutes, and ordinances? Do you know the difference between God's sacred law and ceremonial law? And, and, and if you're going to set yourself up as a scripture lawyer, you better know the difference. Every Christian should know anyway the difference between the law and, and statutes and ordinances, ceremonial activities. It keeps you out of a lot of trouble. The law never, ever, ever changes. Ordinance do, especially blood ordinances. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. He had one by Hagar and the other by Sarah. And, and, and bear in mind, God had, uh, Sarah being barren, she sent Hagar into Abraham and um, which later she would regret, because from that came Ishmael and the Arabian people of today. But uh, the free woman, God approached, she was 90 years old. And Abraham was 100. When she conceived Isaac in her womb. Okay, verse 23. And he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. That was Ishmael. But he of the free woman was born by promise, promise from the living God, that his offspring, because, why? Because Christ would come through that lineage. And um, uh, by this, that uh, God would bring forth that promise. Verse 24, which things are an allegory of these, for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth uh, to bondage, which is Hagar. 25, and then we'll explain this. It's a little bit deep, and yet it isn't if you'll let it flow here. 25, for this Agar, and this be Hagar from the Hebrew, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Now, to understand this, the scripture is a little bit 
contaminated there for for what it truly says in the manuscripts is that for this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. In the Arabian tongue, Hagar means stone, rock. In, in, I'm, I'm saying Arabian tongue, not the Hebrew, not the Greek, not the Aramaic. In the, in the Arabian tongue, Hagar means rock. And Sinai means rock in the Arabian tongue. And um, what, what he's saying here, to them... Uh, she be, they, they called Mount Sinai the rock in the Arabian tongue. But these two covenants, especially today in this generation, you should be aware of them. Eventually, it opens up through Christ comes salvation to all, even Ishmael, if and only if he will be a believer. Otherwise, um, he's not. And their rock becomes something that certainly is not our rock. And in their own tongue, um, we, we see that difference. This is the allegory he was referring to. He says, look at it, see it, see it for yourself, and understand. And let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 26. But Jerusalem, that's Yerushalayim, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. In other words, um, have, this would be the place for Messiah. It would be the place where his birth would be very near there at Bethlehem. And um, certainly um, the fact that it was a promise of God. Well, well, where is that promise at? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, A virgin shall conceive, she'll have a male child. You will call him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. <clears throat> that was God's approach. Not through Ishmael. You can call him rock, and you can call Sinai rock in the Arabian tongue. But that wasn't the birthplace of the Messiah, and so it is. But, under the contract or the covenant, they are included if, if they meet the condition of following Messiah. Verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath had an husband. Now, of course, this is quoting Isaiah 54, 1. Who, who is this barren one? Well, let's spend just a moment on it, because as Christ was walking up the hill of Golgotha, and the daughters of Jerusalem were beside that path. They were weeping. And this you would find in Luke chapter 23. They were weeping for him. And he said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Though I'm going up here to be crucified, don't weep for me. For if they will do this to the green tree, which means his flesh body, what are they going to do to the spirit? And then he said, the day will come when it will be said, blessed are the barren, meaning that, that remain a virgin when the Antichrist comes, that you're not deceived and, and uh, fall into his ilk and, and even be spiritually impregnated when the true Christ returns expecting a virgin. And what does he find? You do not want to go there. So... Uh, this is why this barren is brought into this, so that you would wake up and realize and even um, cover, if you would, that uh, Luke 23 of what happened on that hill to Golgotha, because it's, he's speaking of God's election, that um, they're going to remain barren away from the false Christ when untold millions will wed him by deception and Unfortunately, how proud our Father is of those that stay in the field working. That is to say, this world not falling for his lies, his tricks. Yes, there are two covenants. And one is, is um, a good covenant. The other is a good covenant. If, if they will believe upon Messiah. Next verse, 28. And verse 28 reads, 
Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That's to say, those of the house of Israel and those that love the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of what, you are part of the promise then, even if you are adopted in. 29, that would say, if you were Ishmael and adopted in through Christ, you're in good shape. You're of the promise. Verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And I will say again, those that Ishmael born of the flesh does persecute Christians, kills Christians, burns Christian churches. And um, in this world, even today, and it's a kind of a bitter pill. But it was written long ago that it would come to pass, so don't let it be a surprise to you. What you do is you be wiser than the serpent and as peaceful as a dove. Verse 30. Nevertheless, um, what saith the Scripture... Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That was to say at that time until Christ would come, 31 to complete that thought. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. When, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you are of the, the seed of promise, which is to say Christ. When you become a Christian, what, what does Christian mean? It means you're a Christ man, and you belong to him. He, he owns your soul. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls belong to God. So let that be known. But um, only in the seed of promise can one attain eternal life. Otherwise, you're going to go in circles in this earth age, destroying, killing, blowing up people. Really a godly thing to do, what? But then it's written, and that's as it is, and so it is. Chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't, for heaven's sakes, when Christ makes you free, don't let some church or anyone else put you in bondage. You know, uh, you know it, it is very difficult for me to understand how some people can teach Christ and his forgiveness total and still hang up people with sin. Example, a divorcee. You'll have to go to the back of the church, and we don't want you teaching any Sunday school classes. And the poor woman repented for any problem she may have had with it, and Christ forgave her and gave her a clean start. What kind of Christian would question that? You're, you're doubting Christ if you hang those chains of bondage on a free-born Christian person regardless of what they are, if they have repented. You stand fast in that liberty and don't let someone put you in bondage. That's the beauty of Christianity. It's Christ forgives. He has the power and the ability. He paid an awesome price to have that ability. He died on the cross for you for it. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Circumcision anymore in that bloodletting has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with salvation. Why? Because, because Christ shed the last blood that is necessary on the cross. If you want to be circumcised for hygiene purposes, fine, no problem. But it isn't, don't ever do it for spiritual reasons. Verse 3, for I testify, I assure you, again, to every man that is circumcised, that uh, he is a debtor to do the whole law. You do that, you, gotta, you better do every last law. If you're going to put your salvation by law rather than by Christ, you better do every one of them, along with circumcision, 
or, or guess what? You're not going to make it. And can flesh man do that? No, he can't. You're going to break some of them. And you're doomed. But Christ set you free. Verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. You've fallen from that promise. What a shame. And what a sin for people to turn back to legalism in the old way when we have freedom in Christ. Verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And it is that faith that, that sets us free. When we believe and when we see, we walk by faith, not by sight. We know that what is written in God's Word is true. When you rightly um, teach it and understand it, it's going to see you through. Verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. In other words, circumcision is not going to make any difference to you one way or the other. Whether you are or not, it does not matter spiritually. It has nothing whatsoever to do with salvation any longer. And, and this is a hard lesson for many people to understand. The, the Old Testament is very pertinent. It is something we all need to know and understand. At the same time, if you convert back to the old ceremonial law and ordinances, I'm not talking about the law now, again comes into play the fact that you better know the difference between law, statutes, and ordinances. You start messing around with them and pretty soon you've got yourself back under the law again and you have broken the promise or your, your inheritance to that promise when it was there for you all the time. Why would you want to do that? So rightly dividing the word of God is to know the difference between those uh, things that do make a difference. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 7. You do run well. Uh, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You, you really went for it. You, you know, you came into this real well. But um, what's, what hindered you to, to hear that word and obey it? Verse 8, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. You didn't get that from me, Paul is saying. I certainly didn't bring it to, to you clearly and understood. Verse 9, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And, and this is very true. You know, many people right away, they'll say, well, it's the leaven that does it. You know, it's Passover. Get all the leaven out of your house. And you see what you're doing? You're slipping right back into the old way and tradition. What does leaven then signify? Sin. All it's saying is get the sin out of your house. Not, not some bread, not some object. That's not, it's not going to help your family one iota to cleanse your house of leaven uh, yeast. Um, uh, that is to say, it, with, within bounds of health. But what leaven symbolizes is sin. And if you let in a little bit of sin, and many times people will throw out all the bread... And then they leave the boob tube going with the filth and everything else that is fed into your home and, and, and celebrate Passover. Oh, joy to the world. You know, isn't that great? You, know, you, you have to go by what God's word signifies and what Christ became. And you let in, what he's, all he's saying here is you let a little sin and a little of the old teaching in and just as yeast, when you work up the dough and you put in a little bit of yeast, it's going to go through that whole loaf. 
it is with sin. You let in a little bit of sin and it's going to go through the whole loaf. That's what he's talking about. Stick with the gospel. The gospel is God's spell. It's the good news. And you want to stick with it. Verse 10, we continue. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But be, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Whoever tries to de turn you away from the simplicity that is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will pay for it dearly. And I believe that with all my heart. That's why if you're going to set yourself up as a teacher, you better do your homework and you better do it well. Because if you mislead people, you the, the hammer falls on you, my friend. And so it is. Verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. If, if, even if I um, be, uh, started preaching circumcision, they would still persecute me. The, the, um, but if you were to preach that you had to be circumcised, the way of the cross is lost. Well, what is the cross? It's salvation. It's Christ. Christ crucified. And uh, you cannot stop preaching that. But if you go back into legalism, that's exactly what you're doing. You're making Christ's death on the cross of none effect. I would they were even I would they were even cut off, which troubled you. Uh, this this probably should be explained. You know what it says in the Greek? If I'm going to trouble you by teaching you still must be circumcised then I just assume they cut the whole thing off. That's Paul's uh, uh, patience with them. You, you want to do that for religious reasons, just cut the whole thing off. Let's, if you're going to practice it, uh, get to it. And you can see he's, he's not frustrated, but he, he's laying it on the line. It doesn't make any difference. It's, circumcision is no part of it. It has nothing to do with salvation except for circumcision of the heart. That is to say, to, to love the Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done for us. Starting a new life. Understanding him. Following him. Verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. You're free. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. By, but by love serve one another. In other words, don't, don't take that liberty wrong. Enjoy it. Enjoy the freedom that Christ gives you. To enjoy life. To have, have uh, pleasure. And you should. It is amazing to me how quickly some people can, they will listen to some preacher or somebody that will put them in bondage. And, and certainly uh, they will do it. Just like an example, I will call it up again. We had a, a question from a lady. Do I have to divorce my husband? I've been married before and the church says I must, uh, uh, that it isn't right. Well, if Christ forgave her, it's right. And then we had a, another uh, from uh, an elderly lady saying that the church insisted she come before them and confess all of her sins. Be reasonable. We're at freedom. She repented. She had no sins. But the good deacon still wanted to pull each one of them out and confess it. You know what God said about that? I don't want to hear about it again. And, and yet a church would insist that from an 85-year-old woman? Um, and, and we hopefully set her free. That because she had repented, she had no sin, therefore she had nothing to confess before the deacon board. 
and, and that is a true fact, and that will, that will um, pass muster with our Heavenly Father. And that's what he means with this. You've been called unto liberty. You're, you are free from the hang-ups of people that would put you back in bondage once you have repented. That's very necessary to repent and have sins forgiven. But then they're gone. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, uh, what, what an interesting verse. Did you notice something there that you need to be very clear about? It said, love your neighbor as yourself. It didn't say, love your brother as yourself. You see, biblically, there's a difference between a brother and a neighbor. A brother is one born into the womb of Israel, and a neighbor is one adopted into the house of Israel, that is to say, Christ and his salvation. So what it's saying is, even Ishmael being a neighbor, if, one word, if he loves the Lord Jesus Christ and returns that love, then he has no problems. It opens to everyone. Whomsoever will. That's what it says. 15 to continue. But if you but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of the other. I mean, if, if you're going to take legalism and tear each other up, I, I'd be real careful. You'll probably destroy each other. And most likely would. The love of the living God and the price that Christ paid on the cross to bring you salvation. Don't let someone make a mockery of that. Don't let someone belittle that and say, so this is needed or that is needed when you have liberty at repentance. How precious it is that Father loves us enough that he gives us that option to love him and to be loved by him. Don't ever lose that. It's gift from God. That's what's so very important, especially in this end generation. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?